Hello, how are you guys doing? Welcome to Monday Night Muse, the final installment of the Siege of Mandalore content. <laughs> so I hope you guys are doing well. Let me just, of course, check audio. I just, I just sat down. Um, so thanks guys for waiting there a couple minutes, but let's go ahead and see how the YouTube is faring. Of course, we do have some, some dropped Wi-Fi occasionally, so always just stick around until I come back in case I uh, drop out. So audio sounds good on my end, but you know, I'd love to have some, some confirmation there. And uh, I'll go ahead and welcome, thank you, Wolf10, audio loud and clear sound. Thank you, awesome. Um, so yes, I am your humble hostess, Sound Grover, so. I hope you guys are all doing fantastic. This will be a lighthearted stream, a pretty um, uh, easygoing stream. Not much to say. I, I've covered, you know, two fixed commentary videos, a couple of streams on the, the terribly flawed writing of the Siege of Mandalore. And so we're just going to, you know, pack it into different categories, just a few categories on, I would say, the missteps on, on how to avoid the writing of people like Dave Filoni. Now, this is not really to pick on Dave Filoni as a person. I saw a couple of his interviews as I was looking for images of him for my thumbnail, of course. He's a likable guy. He's a really cool guy. Um, I think he'd be really fun to hang out with. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, pick apart his, his writing and, and learn from his writing and what not to do. And actually, more than that, it's just not it's not just a Dave Filoni. Look for this kind of thing in any writing that Disney produces, any writing that Lucasfilm produces. Um, these are really the telltale signs of the writing that you see now, maybe perhaps with shows like WandaVision or The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So uh, with that in mind, we'll go ahead and welcome the chat. And I will say one other thing, one other thing. Um, my upcoming album is coming to you soon. My space ambient album, it's more upbeat, so it's not complete space ambience, but I had a breakthrough Saturday in my composing. I'm going to finish a piece hopefully tonight, maybe getting into tomorrow. Got new instruments for the bass and harmony section of this one piece. I'm really excited. And I'm ready to pay my mastering engineer, Syntho Electro, and his fee is very reasonable. And I am ready to pay it, but I could use the extra support. I do have uh, a donation link, a PayPal donation link in the uh, description below, if, if you're watching on a device, of course. I can't see it on my end. Um, but yes, I do have a link. If you would like to support the project, uh, I would be very, very grateful. Um, a couple dollars here or there would be fantastic. And also just sharing the link, you know, sharing the link to your friends. It's going to be a fun album. When, when, when we get that nice and tight, I think, I, I don't know. I'm, I feel good. I feel good. Still work to be done, work to be had, but I feel good about this upcoming album. It's a four track album. As I said, upbeat space, ambient kind of instruments, some synth instruments, some really nice synth instruments. And, um, I think it'll be a, a joy to hear. It's, it's been a joy to, uh, you know, put together. So anyway, go check that link out. You can also, actually, I'll just go ahead and do it. I'll go onto my website and share my website. There's a, there's a donation tab. Let's see if I can share that. Share screen, brave tab, uh, sound engraver. All right. Let's see if that works. Does that work? Awesome. There's my website, and this is the first page, the home page that you would see if you went on to the URL. And just scrolling all the way down, you can see this yellow PayPal donate, bu donate button. So that would be helpful as well. So a couple of ways to, to donate and, and help support the project. If you would, that'd be, that would be terrific. So now I think we can go ahead and welcome the chat. And then we'll talk about writing, more writing, more good stuff. Big Al says first, and he fronts it with a rather loaded question, which I will get to because this is an important question. What are some story choices you would have made, Sound Engraver? So I'm assuming it's story choices for 
the Siege of Mandalore. And I will put all that in a nutshell. I did explain a little bit of that um, with my streaming videos and also my commentary videos, but I'm happy to to put that in a, in a neat package for you as well. So remind me, guys, I'll, I'll try to get back to that question. And Dr. Y. Have you heard of the tragedy of Dave Filoni, the unwise? I thought not. It's another tale Disney fans would not tell you. I hope I hope that was an okay Palpatine impression. Alec, nice to see you. This should be a good one. I hope so. It will be my last one. I I it's gonna be out of my system after after tonight. I'm I am so happy with the content that I have provided and I, I'm ready to move on. But there are some important points, and we will get to that soon. And Netter's network is in the house, and she calls me sweetie. Hi, lovely Netter. I hope you enjoy your doing well. I hope you guys' jobs are doing also well. And uh, sounds like you've been, have you been put in a, I thought it was a leadership type position or a man, is it called managerial? Is that is that a word? I'm talking about writing and I don't know how to say a word correctly. Schooner Tuna is in the house. Nice to see you, man. Good to see you. And the professor is a little late, you know, compared to everyone else. <laughs> I'm ready for my beautiful sage to drop some truth. Yes. And you helped me with some truth, you know, last night when we were talking. It was fun. All right. And Wolf10 and Melissa Harris, they are two in the house. And that might be every... Oh, Zootopia with his hi, everyone. Welcome, Zootopia. And we've got a new person Travis Smith, nice to see you. Maybe maybe you're not new. Maybe you haven't caught any of these streams. I pretty much put this uh, video on all my social media, so maybe I may, might be attracting some some newcomers. Oh, uh, Netter confirms, I'm a fulfillment coordinator. Our jobs are going great. Thanks for asking. Absolutely, I'm I'm so happy. I, I'm just I'm just glad that is you know long you know out of the way you know not not having the work. Um, I'm glad, I'm glad you two have work. Um, okay. So, um, let's, let's actually unpack this, this question by Al. Uh, what are some story choices you would have made Sound Engraver for? I'm guessing the Siege of Mandalore. Okay. Siege of Mandalore. I have no problem with that setting and that story. Ahsoka, Bo-Katan, and their troops, not the clone troopers, not the Republic, no Jedi business, just Ahsoka, Bo-Katan, her forces, her men and women, and Ahsoka working, you know, stealthily and learning the ways of the Force because she has no other help besides Bo-Katan and her troops, and, and taking down Maul after, like, an obstacle course of, you know, working through Maul's army, you know, and, and learning the Force without lightsabers. Uh, and then ultimately, Ahsoka joining Maul, if only to protect Maul from Kenobi, or or you know, stop him, or or at least mitigate his chaos, you know, his his way of chaos in the world. Uh, now, I I explained all that on my video. I think it was a uh, the moral danger of Ahsoka Tano. Uh, I, there there was a little bit in that video where I explained why she should have joined Maul. She would have been the light side and he would have been the dark side that 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 dichotomy and that that constant conflict between the two characters because those two characters are beloved so yeah i would have had ahsoka tano with bo katan and her people and 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 overthrow maul or maybe at least overthrow the bad mandalorians although i'm not really a fan of bo katan being a good mandalorian uh, but that's besides the point bo katan would overthrow uh, Maul's allies, and and then Ahsoka would join Maul, and then they would have their own story together. I think that would have been a fascinating story. I I don't have time to write fan fiction, uh, but that would that would be something I would do if I were ever to do fan fiction to to, to kind of experiment with that kind of treatment. So Ahsoka and Mandalore is totally fine. I I like that idea. Her doing her own thing, away from the Jedi away from the clone troopers and certainly not involved with Rex and certainly not involved with order 66. And 
I probably would not have made <laughs> any videos on my channel if it happened that way. So that's how I would have approached that arc. Ahsoka could have look, looked really cool and uh, she could have had a very powerful story with, with that kind of idea, or at least the, that's the creative idea. I, I'm not doing the writing myself, but th those are the ideas that I have. Alrighty. <laughs> Samuel Proctor says, did I hear disappointment in that comment about the professor being late? I mean, he's not late, but he was, he was past, past a few people. No, I'm never disappointed with the professor. I tease him sometimes. Uh, I, I kind of pick on him for, because he has, he's, he's just sets these high standards for himself on, on treating me like a lady. And, and I kind of tease him like, oh, you didn't do this this well or something. I'm just, it's like, it's like nitpicking writing. I'm just kidding though. I'm, I am so happy to be the professor's lady. That is for sure. Dr. Y says, I'm still job hunting, uh, but being unemployed, um, I've been able to help my family and friends lately. That's good. <laughs> Yes, that's true. Okay, one last comment and then we'll get to the notes. There is never disappointment in her voice when she talks about me. And I have a little, oh, I'm going to try, I'm going to botch the, the British accent for Bastilla. Uh, <laughs> why am I doing this live? The force fights with me. Like I, I, I kind of do some Bastilla impressions in front of him. He likes that too. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some missteps in Dave Filoni's writing, you know, Dave Filoni, a cautionary tale, all in fun. I'm, I'm not here to berate him. I'm just here to talk about his writing choices and how, whether you're a writer for filmmaking or a comic run or a novel, I think these ideas and these principles hold true, no matter what kind of fiction writing you are doing. I actually think, um, you could do this with nonfiction too. We'll, we'll kind of unpack this. So let me pull up my notes. All right. There are not a lot of notes um, I mean, compared to m my notes usually. Um, so actually I'll just get through, I'll get through these notes first and then we'll have a discussion. And, and really guys, the, the length of the stream depends on your input because I actually really don't have much to say unless I go on a couple of rants. So, Dave Filoni, A Cautionary Tale, How Not to Write. The first thing we need to talk about, and I think the most important thing, one of the most important things we need to talk about is execution. The order of events, the logic of events, the logic of interaction and exchange. So whatever the event, the environment, the interaction, the dialogue, Whatever the case is, your scene has to make sense. So I want to I want to introduce this idea of order of execution, and it's more of a computer science term, but order of execution is really really important. Depending on the syntax and the hierarchy of syntax inside a function, inside a block of code, whatever the order of execution is, however you write that code, is actually going to uh, bear all of, uh, let me, let me see if I can say this correctly. Order of execution is going to really dictate the output, the, the result of what you want your computer to do, what your, what you want your computer to read, um, in, in terms of, uh, flow and function and, in an architecture. So I would say this is pretty important with writing to really in, in any art form, but, order of execution in, in writing, I'll put it this way. If the events leading up to the scene don't make sense, or if the events are completely unnecessary, don't include that scene. So let's talk about the example in The Siege of Mandalore. Um, and that is Ahsoka's meeting with Anakin. It actually doesn't make sense. Her meeting Anakin in person after a couple of years of not being together or a year or so. Her meeting with him actually doesn't make sense when given the context. And here's what I mean. We see them meet after an exchange between uh, their ship or wherever they are 
and his ship. So there's a, there's a transmission, there's a holographic transmission. And then they say, okay, we, we have to talk. We, you know, Bo-Katan is laying out uh, uh, to Kenobi what she wants. She wants this joint operation with the Republic so she can take take down Maul or take him out and, and renew order in Mandalore. Well, if you think about it, the, the scene between the hologram of Ahsoka and her actually meeting Anakin in person is actually pretty urgent in timing. There's this stress, like we don't have time. I mean, even Bo-Katan and her character says every second we waste gives Maul the opportunity to slip away. We, we can't waste our time on this. Now, if that's true, and I think it is, I mean, there is urgency in the, in the matter. There is urgency in the scene. If that's true, then why couldn't all this have been resolved in a simple conference call, you know, a holographic conference call? Everything that Bo-Katan and Ahsoka relay to Kenobi and, and relay to Anakin, you know, albeit, you know, a couple holographic images of, of the city of Mandalore, all of that could have explained, it could have been explained in a single transmission, a single conference call. Why this is important to bring up is Obi-Wan ends up saying no, and he walks out of the room. He he will consult with the council, but not immediately, and she's wanting this immediate reaction, this, this immediate response, and, and this immediate help. And then she is is huffy, and she, she walks out too. So there's actually no real resolve to the conversation anyway, meaning that conversation could have just as has as easily been uh, and that, that 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 conversation could have easily been uh, taken care of through this this transmission between the the you know Ahsoka's holographic image and Anakin you know in 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 that room. Not that we needed to see it play out like that in in a film, but in a real life situation, when the conversation didn't go anywhere, well then why why couldn't have it been just between you know a transmission from one ship to the next? It would have been faster, you know. Bo-Katan would have had her answer much faster. She she probably was resentful that she wasted so much time getting to that point where Anakin and, and Kenobi were. So the, the sense of urgency, like we can't waste any time. Well, then you should have had a conference call. Why didn't you? Well, the reason was we had to bring Anakin and Ahsoka back together for a reunion. So that, that was the only reason. Now, one could argue, well, Michelle, wait a second. Maybe a transmission with this kind of information is dangerous. You know, maybe it's not safe. They are at war after all. Maybe an, a, an enemy droid would intercept this, this exchange. I, I want to actually bring it to the table. That can't even be a risk to begin with, because if you're talking about Star Wars, wars in space or wars among the stars, armies, enemy, ally, they would have had radio technology that, whether encrypted or secure uh, from interception, you know, an enemy interception, they would have had a way to communicate from ship to ship, from location to location safely. If you don't have safe ra radio communication, obviously there can be interception uh, uh, technology and, and, and techniques, of course. But by and large, if, if ships can't safely communicate to one another, for, for tactical reasons, then you kind of destroyed the world building of Star Wars. I think it's perfectly perfectly legitimate, it's perfectly reasonable to, to say that the transmission would be safe and that Bo-Katan could have had this whole thing resolved much quicker, much more quickly than traveling all the way to, to meeting them. So really, the event of Ahsoka actually meeting Anakin again in person doesn't make sense when given that context. Now, people say, well, wait a second. She gets her army. You know, she gets her troops and, and they go to Mandalore. But as I've said in my streaming, you know, my, my streaming a couple weeks ago, and I've said it on my fixed video, my, my fixed commentary, all that is quite contrived because it's, it's Anakin haphazardly suggesting that she be given an army, even though she's not a Jedi. And, and I've, I've covered all that, so we don't need to go into that. But 
it's it's haphazard. It's it's kind of careless. It's 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 reckless, erratic decision making on Anakin's part. So the whole thing of her getting that army to begin with is rather contrived. So the scene, any scene of 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 your books, of your comics, um, whether it's a, a visual piece of fiction or a novel or short story, every scene has to make sense. In the narrative and the plot, every scene has to make sense. The, the, the events leading up to the, the scene, the character exchanges and the motives and the actions leading up to that scene has to make sense. I'm in the process of editing for a final time before sending it to a proofreader. I'm in the process of editing all these chapters of the first installment of my space opera. And there are two chapters I've run into, and, and I'm sad. I'm, I'm sad to say I have to change them. These scenes are so cool. I, I wish I could keep them in the plot. But now that I've written all this stuff ahead of time, and now that I've established a lot more of the world building and, and what has taken place in that kind of world, these two chapters with these scenes, as cool as these scenes are, they just don't make sense in the plot. They don't make sense in the narration. And they certainly, certainly don't make sense in the world building. And I, I don't even think they make physical sense in, in the way of um, how, how space travel would work. So I actually have to not really cheapen the scene, but I have to cheapen, um, not cheapen, I shouldn't say that word. I have to modify the scene or the two scenes, the two chapters where it's not as cool. It's it's not as cool and I'm kind of sad, but I have to do it because it's not gonna make sense otherwise. So have your scenes make sense with everything leading up to that scene. And it's all about execution. So whatever the event, the environment, the, the exchange between characters, the scene has to make sense. So remember order of execution for flow and function. And, and lastly, just just to just to make sense um, of that 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 scene that doesn't make sense between Ahsoka and, and Anakin, you, you can't justify it by saying, "Oh, well, it's so heartwarming that they're back together." Oh, oh, that's so cool that this is happening in that scene. I don't care if it's cool. I don't care if it's heartwarming. You got to change it. You just you just got to change it. All right. Another thing on execution is timing. As a writer, always, always, always consider how things are happening in real time or in the time of your fiction. Even if it's speculative fiction that kind of works outside of time or has an extension of the boundaries of time, but always consider, no matter how fantastical a world you're writing, always consider how long things take or how things work in, in, in that time frame. Make sure your events, your events and your exchanges and your reactions are operating within the limits of time. Time has limitations. We, 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 it's imposed its physical and spatial limitations on us as, as, as people in this physical world. So kind of see as, as, as um, a template for your world building as well. So, the example in Siege of Mandalore is Anakin's tribute to Ahsoka. I, I mentioned this in my previous stream. His arrangement for, for paying tribute to Ahsoka really doesn't make sense in the concept of time. They just finished a battle. Obi-Wan and Anakin just finished a battle taking over this citadel or whatever it was that, that, that the droids were uh, over, you know, overtaking. So they just finished a battle. And, you know, between war and how military works, I, I'm not from the military, but chances are generals, admirals, whatever the case is, after a war and, 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 and with subsequent wars ahead or battles ahead, people are debriefed. People are, are, are given memos. They're given notices. They're, uh, they're, they're given coordinations. They're given new missions or new assignments. For... for him to, you know, for Anakin and, and Obi-Wan to just finish a battle and then receive this transmission from Ahsoka and then have this kind of urgent exchange, like we gotta meet now and we gotta, we gotta 
ask Kenobi if, if he will do this joint operation, you know, that, that sense of urgency. There's no way that Anakin would have had time to get 48 soldiers, half of them paint their helmets in Ahsoka's uh, skin tone, her, her skin color, and then and then salute her when she when she comes. That kind of tribute, I, I could see maybe Rex and maybe two other troopers, maybe maybe like a handful, like three or four, like a total of four or five people. I could I could see that happening, but four dozen with the the helmets painted in that time frame, it just doesn't make any logical sense. Now, Star Wars is space fantasy, but it's not speculative. Time still is 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 working in a very strict frame. So, <clears throat> excuse me, be careful with that. Be careful with how your characters are reacting, what they're doing, and ask yourself, do they have time to do this? Or would this take a much longer time? So let's say Ahsoka meets him and Kenobi maybe a week after the, their exchange. And that gives that extra time. Oh, there might not be a battle. They would have had time to be briefed by the chancellor or the council. All this military stuff could be taken care of in a week's time, for instance. And then Anakin could say, hey, Rex, let's get let's get four dozen of your men. Let's have half of them paint their helmets and, and let's salute Ahsoka. If we're given like a week for that between battles or something, that makes sense. So if you want a scene like that, work it in, but you have to work it within within the uh, frame, within that time frame, or a, a, a more believable time frame, rather. Um, also, in that same scene, uh, you know, Rex's men preparing to board for Coruscant, and then suddenly just whisked off to Mandalore. Now, troopers may be fast and efficient. They may be heading to one planet, and then then they, they're given the signal to go somewhere else completely. But the only character that could have relayed that information that they were going to Mandalore instead of Coruscant, including Rex, would, would have been Obi-Wan Kenobi. He would have had to relate to Rex immediately after walking out of that room saying, actually, you're going with Ahsoka to Mandalore. And, and it's fine, but it's not shown. So it would have been nice, you know, it, it, even, even in the scene, even if they didn't have extra seconds to spare in, in that arc, you know, just a little scene of, of Kenobi in the hallway you know, signaling Rex saying, you're actually going to, uh, to Mandalore with Ahsoka. That would have been fine, but we weren't shown that. So Rex saying, men with me, going to Coruscant, and then him walking up to uh, Ahsoka to to catch a freighter or whatever uh, to Mandalore, it just doesn't look right, given that the time is, film-wise, is, is less than a minute. So, so we've got to be careful about that as well for filmmakers and also for novelists. Let's actually uh, go ahead and take a break, see what the chat is saying. And then uh, I have a few other points to, to talk about. So let's try. You know, my AC is actually quite low for my taste and I'm still really warm. I'm wearing my Rebel shirt because you know, I'm an artist that speaks the truth when it comes to writing and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's pretty clever, uh, Samuel Proctor. Let's see if your code is not code. Your comment is up. There it is. Dave Filoni's scripts are hereby sentenced from the sound engravers, uh, from the sound of engravers to death by order of execution. Yeah, I hope I explained that right. I'm not a computer scientist or I, I'm not a programmer, but that the idea of order of execution is is in the syntax. It has to be a kind of hierarchy and 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 flow of syntax for for a certain result to work. It could be a different result, but if it's not your desired result, then you have to you know, 
adhere to the order of execution. It does sound kind of serious now that I feel like Palpatine should say something like that. Let's see. One thing I forgot to mention in the last stream about the Siege of Mandalore, um, Adi Galia, a Jedi Master, couldn't even touch Savage Opress, let alone Maul, and died trying. Yeah, Ahsoka could beat Maul, right? Yeah, actually, that was the that was the Jedi Master that I, I just didn't know her name. I, I think it's a her, right? I, I don't know what alien species she is. Um, but yeah, she was she was killed. Uh she she and Obi-Wan Kenobi were fighting both Maul and Savage Opress. So it's 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 them. It's uh, Obi Wan with Ventress. I mean, th they were two very powerful people. Uh, and and can you imagine if Palpatine hadn't killed Maul's brother, Ahsoka wouldn't have made it the first step. There there'd have been no way. So it's. I'm not saying this is a plot convenience, but it it, it is. Um, at least it's a little bit more believable, but no, I mean, you know, it, it fits Maul's character to want an apprentice. And I just think Ahsoka would have been a really, they, they would have been, a, they would have had a really good dynamic. It had it, been really interesting. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's see, uh, Samuel Proctor says, is there even a precedent in the Clone Wars war? Live holograms are remotely spied on. Spied on. I only remember them trying to steal recording from a physical memory. I mean, I'm not saying that enemies can't intercept a, a radio signal. That, that That's, you know, that kind of, you know, propagation interception technology. Yeah, that could be worked with and it could make things very, very interesting. Uh, I'm actually working with radio technology in my space opera. That That's one of the main sciences uh, that I'm working with in my space opera. Uh, so yeah, enemies can develop techniques to, to intercept a signal, but that's not that's not without the 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 allies having a, a safe signal. I, I don't think war would work well. War in space when when ships can't communicate safely to each other. I don't think that that just doesn't seem believable to me in that kind of setting. Melissa Harris says. Sound Engraver versus Ahsoka, her arch nemesis. I don't know. I mean, I, I listen. I I would love to like Ahsoka Tano because I liked her up until season five. Even with all her shortcomings in, in the writing in the Clone Wars, there. Yeah, I mean, there there were there were missteps uh, with her character before season five, but I mean, just I, I like her on screen. She's she's very uh, she's very easy to watch. She's she's fun to look at. Um, whatever she's doing, but uh, unfortunately, the writing got in the way. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah, that that's something to consider too. I, again, I haven't seen the Rebels. I've seen her scene with Darth Vader. Anakin meeting Ahsoka again takes away from their meeting and Rebels. Yeah, I mean, well. Also, also, the, the 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 very sad ending of season five. I mean, I I I I cried when I saw that. It's a very heart wrenching scene where Anakin loses his pupil. It doesn't matter anymore because she sees him like a year later, and so the 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 whole meeting has very much underwhelmed the the plot with with Anakin's arc and with Ahsoka's arc. And and I do remember in in the rebel scene where she says, "My master would never, ever be as vile as you." Well, Maul sort of planted seeds in her head with this kind of you know he's becoming the new apprentice of Lord Sidious. Now, I mean, I already have I've said probably half a dozen times now um, how much I disagree with the writing of of that scene where Maul even knows about that. But even if that's the case, she would have had doubt. You know, Anakin, she had that force vision of some kind where she was in a lot of pain because she was experiencing Anakin kill Mace Windu. This is in season seven. So 
with 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 Maul interacting with her and that force vision, it 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 actually makes it underwhelming. Like it would have been much more powerful if if Ahsoka leaves thinking the best of Anakin, having no grudge, no 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 um, resentment against him, just only against the, the Jedi Order. And then come to find out years later that he's become the most vile force user of them all and, and the most vile leader of the empire. That, that, that's, that's shocking. That, that would be a shocking revelation to a character. But, but now she sort of knows that he goes to the dark side. So like past Ahsoka contradicts future Ahsoka and, and people say, well, people change all the time. You know, their past selves are different from their future selves. Well, not if their future selves are written before their past selves. Think about it. I just got meta on you guys. Uh, let's see. Dr. Y says, a time in a story. Oh, I, I've been going way over developing the timeline in my story. There's a 600 year gap. I've been trying to figure out how to fill it or shorten it. Um, I would say, what, what's the, what's the term indirect exposition? You can, you can make, uh, like, like a prologue. Like, I think, I think a powerful way of, um, going over the course of something like 600 years is in the event of a prologue, like a really good, tense, short prologue. I, I worked on a prologue. And it passed, let's see, I think the years passing was 20 or so years. I, I, I took it out. I didn't need it anymore. But but I, I was like, well, how do I explain what happens in 20 years? Well, I do like a one page prologue with, with some mystery and suspense and like, oh, what's going to happen here? I don't think a prologue should be too long, even if it's really good. Yes. So for your visuals, uh, that, that's a really good idea. One unique thing in my art with time is I try to use hair as a passage of time. So yeah, the, the beard grows longer or the hair grows longer. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> that's the execute order of execution. I, I did not even catch that, guys. That's funny. Commander Wolf 10, time has come. Execute order of execution 6-6. Six, six. Uh, or 66 wolf 10 it will be done my lady that's funny that's funny all right i'll get through the oh almost done with the comments wolf 10 says uh adi galia uh was a she definitely featured prominently in star wars content clone wars uh 2d animated jedi power battles jedi style uh starfighter and um first appeared in phantom menace yeah i i think she's sitting down in the council right is that is that correct uh wow that was a near spot on ah ahsoka impression i can't even remember what i did what did i do <laughs> oh was that oh when i was saying um my my master would never be as vile as you I have a way, I mean, if I practice a little bit, I, I have a way of doing impressions. Not not facial impressions, but, but vocal impressions. Samuel Proctor says, I wouldn't bother watching Rebels. One of the many problems is that not Aladdin Ezra pulls Ahsoka out of her death scene against Vader through tra time travel. I saw that scene too. And it just feels... When I first saw that, it didn't feel wrong, but it felt off. It didn't feel right. And and that scene, I, I'm not really a fan of the world between worlds in, in a Star Wars universe. Unless you had some good lore backing that up. But it, oh, like, how does Ezra, Ezra get there? You know, and... Because I, I did see Kanan's death through through that scene, and just I don't know, it just felt strange. <clears throat> yeah, baby, could use the Bible's method. There are the generations of no, no, <laughs> not not for fiction, not for fiction. All right, let's get on to the next point. All right, so I've talked about this a few times now, but it's just really worth repeating. And that is ambiguous writing. 
starting with not understanding the character's motives when you really should. So the example I'm going to give, I, I've given a couple times now, uh, that is Kenobi's motives for asking Ahsoka to talk with Anakin about spying on Palpatine. His motives there should have been known for a couple of reasons. One is, if we don't know his motives, there's there's actually just no reason he would even bring that up because it actually contradicts his character. It con contradicts his own character in The Revenge of the Sith. We do see he, he's conflicted a little bit, but he's still pushing Anakin to spy on Palpatine because he just does not trust Palpatine. He's feeling very weird. It's not just by the will of the council, but you see on, you know, Ewan McGregor's face acting Obi -Wan, acting as Obi-Wan, he's, he's just not sure of this chancellor anymore. So he is pretty suspicious of the chancellor. But if he is feeling a sense of conflict and he's trying to receive some affirmation from Ahsoka, then we need to be shown that because he actually goes against the will of the council by even bringing it up to Ahsoka. How do I know? Because the council refuses to reveal any more information about Lord Sidious to Ahsoka. So why, why is Kenobi kind of acting like this, you know, working off the grid, so to speak? He, he really... Yes, he learns from his mistakes. He learns from his past and, and his suppositions and his perspective on life and on, on the Jedi after the events of Revenge of the Sith. But up until that point, up until Order 66, and then, you know, of course, living on Tatooine and, and protecting Luke, he really should work in accordance with the Council. So his contradicting the Council in this scene, talking with Ahsoka, does not make sense unless it is clearly shown to us that he has incredible, an incredible amount of conflict about having Anakin spy on Palpatine. If that's not shown, that is an example of ambiguous writing because he's contradicting his character in The Revenge of the Sith and he's contradicting the will of Yoda and Mace Windu, um, you know, revealing this extra information to Ahsoka. So that's one example of ambiguous writing. Uh, the other, as I mentioned on my previous stream, uh, very confusing dialogue. So, so Maul's exclaiming to Ahsoka, you survived. Survived what exactly? Now we know, we know that there is a, a Jedi slaughter happening. And, and, and the clone troopers know, obviously, because they're, they're under this, this control. But we are not shown that Maul knows this. We, we are not shown that uh, he he's he's kind of seen, like, we, we need this montage. We need to hear the montage. We need to see the montage of him seeing a Jedi slaughter. If he does not see a Jedi slaughter taking place, why does he say you survived? What did you survive? As I said before, he senses death, but not on this slaughter not on this level of genocide. He senses death with Mace Windu. He senses death with his interaction, this kind of psychic interaction with Palpatine and Anakin. But beyond that, we don't see this huge, massive, global scale of death of the Jedi. So his, you survived, doesn't make sense if we're not seeing that he sees the Jedi slaughter. So be careful with your dialogue. If, 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 you, if you have your character say something when really they don't have any knowledge of the situation, but you have knowledge of the situation as an author or the readers have knowledge of the situation as readers or viewers, if you're, you know, um, a comic book writer or a filmmaker, just do be careful that the person that their dialogue is strictly dependent on what they know of the matter, what they know of the world. Their dialogue cannot be based on anything the viewer knows or anything other characters know that they don't know. Unless we're given a montage of Maul seeing the Jedi slot. So that's, that's the first thing. Or that's pretty much the thing on dialogue. Okay. And actually I, I, I um, was, was thinking about this actually it came up last night talking with the prof um, another example of ambiguous writing, and actually that has to do with Ahsoka's reaction to Anakin's killing Count Dooku. So this deserves a swig of water. So 
I've I've belabored on my videos, both my my fixed commentary videos and also my streaming videos. I have belabored the point that Kenobi revealing any information about Lord Sidious is for us to see Ahsoka's reaction on killing Count Dooku. Her face reveals this kind of shock, this awe and this shock of Anakin killing him as if, you know, she's thinking in her head, well, why would he do that? What, what, what caused him to do that? There's this kind of grave concern. Like her, her face gets really soft, like kind of an, a kind of an innocence, like, like a kid uh, learning something of their older sibling or maybe a parent do some, something questionable. But if you think about it deeply and I didn't think about it until now or t until last night, that reaction, that shocked face does not make sense when given the context. For instance, why would she be shocked at all about Anakin killing Count Dooku? We actually see in the Clone Wars, in, in the series, first of all, Count Dooku is a lethal Dark Force user who wields a red blade every time we see him, pretty much, unless he's working with, you know, the, the Viceroy's. Oops, sorry, guys, my, my cable. I just, I just touched my cable. Sorry. Whew. It's a... That's, it's not the only thing that's you know hot on this stream. I'm I'm, I'm getting pumped. So, where was I? Um, yes, the, ca the the killing of Count Dooku. So she's shocked. But why would she be shocked? Really, if you think about it, they've been in war. She's been in war ever since she was a little kid, training as a Jedi. They they've had conflicts. They've had battles. Enemies have been taken out. Jedi have been taken out. There's death and battle. So you know. And, and we've seen Anakin confront Dooku a couple of times. I don't know how many times, but we've seen that blue blade go against Count Dooku's red blade in a moral, uh, mortally dire situation where one opponent, one, one combatant can go down, you know, in death. It, it's, we've seen with Anakin and Dooku a fight to the death, a fight of, uh, you know, light side against dark side and, and, and vice versa. So, it's, it's believable to learn of this news, Anakin killing Count Dooku, and say, oh, Anakin finally had the upper hand. He finally just smote that enemy. He finally just struck that last blow. And, and, and this is a victory for the, for, for, for the Republic. You know, this is a dangerous force user leader of, of, of the Separatists. This, this is a victory on our side of the battle. Anakin did it. He, he, he was the victor in that final fight against Dooku. The shock, if you think about it, uh, that shocked face can only come from the ethics of Anakin's killing, the questionable killing of Count Dooku. Now, we know from seeing the Revenge of the Sith that, that Anakin has his blades crossed and he's, he slits you know, he slices open Count Dooku's throat. There's an exchange between Anakin and Palpatine before that death. Anakin says, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't. And then when he does it, he says, after Palpatine says he's too dangerous to be kept alive, Anakin's like, he, he's so conflicted with what he has done. It's not the Jedi way. I should have let him be put to trial, bring him to justice. I shouldn't have taken his life. Now we see that in the Revenge of the Sith. But you know who only sees that? Anakin and Palpatine, not even Kenobi. If you remember, Kenobi's knocked out from that stairway or something like, you know, the force is, you know, you know, kind of cuts, cuts into his abdomen. Maybe he, he loses air or something, but he, he, he passes out like he's, he's totally knocked unconscious. So Kenobi doesn't see the killing. Of, of Count Dooku, even in the Revenge of the Sith, he says, "You know, you you save the pa uh, you save the Chancellor, and you killed Count Dooku." As if Kenobi is seeing Anakin killing him, ethically speaking, in in a in a hand to hand combat where where Anakin's life is on the line, and he's he has to make that final blow to only protect himself. He's not he's not Kenobi did not see Count Dooku get get executed unfairly, you know, uh, according to the, the Jedi code. So Ahsoka shouldn't even be reacting to the, the ethics of his killing. 
you know, if she's shocked, really based on her knowledge of the situation, she's shocked because, whoa, Anakin killed him finally. That's the shock that should be there. But that's not the shock we see. That's the shock of why would he do that? Why why would he kill Count Dooku without, you know, bringing, bringing him to trial? It was an unfair execution. No, not, not what we've seen with the Clone Wars, the animated series, where if, if Anakin has to take down an enemy, if he has to take a life just to protect himself and protect his fellow men, he's going to do that. You know why? Because that's a battle. <laughs> that's part of being a soldier. That's part of being a knight. And I'm not even in the military. So anyway, her shock is actually based on our knowledge of the situation, not her knowledge. And what's more, not even Kenobi's knowledge. That's crazy when you think about it. So again, ambiguous writing, ambiguous motives, ambiguous dialogue, and a, an ambiguous reaction. Her shock should have been meant for something else. Like, oh, well, it's finally over. Not, not the, the actual ethical decision, that, that, um, that reprehensible decision that Anakin made concerning Count Dooku. So... We established ex execution and ambiguous writing. Let's go ahead and take a look at the chat. Whew. All right. Do do do. Daniel Craig says. To be fair, hyperspace is actually a world between worlds. Well, yeah, but, but in the, only in the sense of travel, not stasis, not an actual environment to stay. So, I, I that that's true to some extent, but but we have to be honest with how that's working compared to hyperspace. So I'm grateful the council is asking you of this, not me. Is it, is that a line? I'll have to look at that. I don't remember that being a line. No, he doesn't say not me, unless that's a different edition that I didn't see. He says, he. Had, I remember that, I'll have to look at the movie, but I think the council is asking you of this, but I don't think he says not me, unless it's a, I can't remember what edition I had. Um, I would say just, just to be safe, we should have still been established a clear motive on, on Kenobi's part. Um, it, so if he is dealing with conflict, he should have been clear with Ahsoka on that. Like, oh, I agree with you. Like, something like that. Something like that. That would have been, that'd been fine. Samuel Proctor uh, says, the whole reason Obi-Wan privately tells Anakin to spy outside the meeting so it wouldn't be on council No, that's not, no, 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 no. Council records, not the council's will. The council wanted Anakin to spy on Palpatine. This is not, this is not something uh, only on, on Kenobi's part. He's, he's pretty much just ushering the news in to Anakin because he's, he's like a brother figure. And he, he knew, like he knew Kenobi knew and the council knew that Anakin would not be up for this. He would not agree to this. But just because it's not on council records doesn't mean that that's not the council's will. We, that is clearly established in the Revenge of the Sith that the council wanted Anakin to spy. That, that, was, that was Anakin's mission when Anakin went to, um, or Kenobi went to uh, Utapau? Is that, no, no, that's so, I can't remember what, I can't remember the, um, the, the planet that Kenobi went to uh, in the Revenge of the Sith. But while he was doing that and trying to take down Grievous, um, that, that was Anakin's mission. That was the will of the council. So no, it has nothing to do with records. Well, I mean, that's, that's part of the plot. Like that's, that makes it all the more nefarious of the council, but it is the council's will to, uh, to have that happen. I hope, I hope I read that correctly. Cause <laughs> I want to be sure we're getting that clear. Wolfton says, know what you want out of your characters and delegate what knowledge each should have. 
Who knows what and how? Who knows someone intimately? And how does it serve uh, and how does it serve their character? Yeah. Yeah, knowledge of the situation, knowledge of the matter, knowledge of the environment, knowledge of the world is really, really important to establish what is known by the characters and what is not known by the characters. Um, I was talking about with with talking about this with the prof last night. Um, there, there's a I don't know how popular this term is, um, but uh, knowledge gap. So. That's, that's a term that I learned from the writer on writing. Uh, his name is James Scott Bell. And he introduced this idea of knowledge gap. I don't know if that he, he coined that or if that's actually a, a common term in writing. But knowledge gap can be used very effectively in terms of plot and suspense. So knowledge gap is, is simply meaning a character or a group of people or whatever the situation is. Let's just start with a, a character, a protagonist, not having knowledge of a situation that every other character has knowledge of or that other characters like one or two other characters have knowledge of maybe the character doesn't have knowledge of a certain world or a certain area or doesn't have knowledge of a certain person they're they're engaged with that the reader has or the other characters have like the reader has knowledge of a situation and uh, other characters have knowledge of a situation uh, that works really effectively with suspense because when that certain knowledge is revealed, especially if it's a big reveal, that could the, the reaction of that character could be um, uh, really impactful in terms of plot. Um, I have I have it um, way down way down the line of my story where um, the the protagonist is not aware of a very very key thing, but the reader is. And people would could argue say, well, well, what's what's the big deal about that? That's not suspenseful because we we know about it. Well, the suspense is not actually not knowing about what's going on on the reader side. The suspense is how is this character going to react to this very critical information when it when it is revealed to that person? It's like a, a make or break the person. Like, will the will the person just just quit and not go, or will the person still try to survive, or will the person uh, go bad? Or will the person try to overcome this this obstacle in a, in a virtuous way? So so the suspense is you know us you know the reader knowing something where the main character doesn't, and then the reaction of the character that's where the suspense is going to take place. That's that's where the, the suspense is leading us to this character knowing uh, being revealed. You know very important information. Uh, an, another good example of knowledge gap is the reader not knowing what what the characters know. So um, how I'm laying out exposition is is suspense and mystery. So so the reader is understanding that there's there, there's a bigger thing happening that the reader is not aware of, based on natural dialogue between characters that do know the situation. So it's leaving the reader guessing. Well, what are they talking about? What does this mean? Um, you know, are are they even good guys or bad guys? I'm I'm not sure. That kind of mystery, that kind of suspense, can work really well when the reader has a knowledge gap. When when the reader is not aware of the whole situation. Um, so knowledge gaps can work um, really effectively. In, in Ahsoka's case, where, where she's reacting to the uh, questionable killing of Count Dooku, well, she doesn't even know it's questionable. For all, all she, if I if I was put in her situation, I would think of just I'm seeing I'm seeing two blades at it, a blue blade and a red blade, and the red blade did not have the upper hand in one fleeting moment because Anakin and all his cunning knew how to take the man down. That would be a natural reaction of Ahsoka Tano. But it's our reaction of what we saw in the Revenge of the Sith, not what she knows what happened. So it's it's pretty pretty eye opening when you really think about everything. Everything must fall in the right context. When given the context, things either make sense in that world or they don't. I'll see. I don't know what that means, Wolfton. At least you don't have Snap, Crackle, Pop. 
Oh, wait, are you talking about the Profs Gaming streams? I don't mind those. <laughs> Alex saying, all in favor of Sound Engraver analyzing the writing of RWBY. Raise your hand. I don't even know what that is, and I'm afraid to look it up. <laughs> Uh, if it has anything to do with anime, I'm, <laughs> I don't watch anime, guys. Um, let's see. Wolfton says, that's where I head tilted on. The fact that the Jedi are morally reprehended at the thought of killing someone in the time of war. Yeah, it's war. Now, I'm not, I'm not in favor of the Jedi condoning unethical killings. <laughs> Count Dooku, man. You saw the Clone War series. There, there are times where, where he's he is brutal with Anakin, and Anakin's still like that Jedi Knight. He's still kind of young. He's still very powerful, but it's like, oh, this this guy is pretty lethal. Will Anakin make it? Oh, are these other analysts? I don't know who these guys are. It's my first time hearing her do an analysis. Um, uh, I think she could take Miles and Carrie to task. Well, thank you. It's Green Lion Girl. Hello. Green Lion Girl. I'll try to make those streams, but uh, my Wednesday schedule started filling up. I'm, I'm actually, I, I taught for an hour at home on Wednesday, so I had all the time to do my sound experimentation videos and stuff. That I'm commuting again, and I've got more students now on Wednesday, so I, I can't, I'm not staying home anymore on Wednesdays. It's so sad. Uh, so I'll try to make your streams, but uh, my Wednesday night's actually filled up, unfortunately. But I actually, I need to see your Final Fantasy VII replay, at least, because I, st I, I still want to keep up with the story and, and see how different it is from the original. Wolf 10 says, Sound Engraver, unless there was a scene where the council ordered Obi-Wan and Anakin to capture him, but we didn't see any, any evidence of that. Plus, their mission was to rescue Palps. That was it. That was it. I think I read that right. To capture Count Dooku? Well, originally, isn't it... Um, General Grievous is known to have captured the Palpatine Chancellor, <laughs> Chancellor Palpatine. Um, I think, isn't it with Dooku that it's it's a surprise? I'm not sure, but I, I don't, no, no, I think they knew Dooku was on board. I, I can't remember, to be honest, it, it has been a while since I've seen the film. I just remember it pretty well. Wolfton says, it was a line from the Re Revenge of the Sith. Anakin asks, why are you asking this to me? As if to ask Obi-Wan directly. Uh, Obi-Wan says that line to cement that he is st still his friend. And, oh, is there more? And wouldn't ask Anakin to do that. Maybe a time later, but the council has done it. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I can, I can see that. But if he, concerning the scene with Ahsoka, he, he would have to be more direct because it's not known to the audience. Even people with knowledge of the Revenge of the Sith, it's not known what his, his motives are. Like, tell us directly. Tell Ahsoka. This is, this is a secret. I mean, it's a secret. It, it's a secret. You know, obviously... He wants to be stealth-like about this. Tell Ahsoka directly, I'm agreeing with you. Go talk to Anakin and tell him it's a bad idea. But why not tell Anakin himself? See, again, it's 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 creating more problems. So I'm I'm actually not condoning or or defending even that line in the Revenge of the Sith. It's you know that those movies have questionable things too in the writing. At least the story is for the most part, linear and, and makes sense. But yeah, I would, I would still say, I would still say if, if, Ob if Obi-Wan had, if Obi, I don't know. I, I just feel, I, I know he has misgivings about 
about the situation, but it could have maybe cement those misgivings with the scene with Ahsoka. I'd have been satisfied if, if it was just direct. Like, I, I agree with you, Ahsoka. I'm not in favor of this. Go, go tell Anakin that this is wrong. But seriously, honestly, then Obi-Wan, you go tell Anakin that this is wrong. That it, it's making Obi-Wan careless, you know, with these characters looking careless, more careless than is in their character. I'm not against careless characters, but it's 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 not Obi-Wan using di discretion as he should be at this point. He's he's really at that peak. Of, of knighthood, he would have better discretion. That's just my opinion. Dr. Y says, I need to make a video on my story to better explain it. I'm divided between starting in one era or another. Both are connected by family lineage. I I mean, if I, I would just say what, what story sounds more fun, right? Write the more fun story. Um, yeah, write, write the write the story that is more enjoyable. It, it doesn't have to be in order as far as time. You know, you can, you can write a story in the future and then write the past. Uh, Samuel Proctor says, in the CG Clone Wars show, show, Anakin brutally murders unarmed people all the time and trying to hint he's going to be Darth Vader way too often. Even if Ahsoka knew all, how he killed Count Dooku, she shouldn't be surprised. That's right. There you go. There you go. Oops. Whoa. I just had a... Um, all right. We'll read a few more. Uh, I didn't, I didn't sneeze. Uh, there was, there was like a breadcrumb on my keyboard and I, and I blew it away. All right. Let's see what uh, Samuel Proctor says. Uh, and then we'll continue on with the next thing. There's a distinct difference between suspense and surprise, and yet many pictures continually confuse the two. Let's suppose that there's a bomb underneath this table between us. Nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's an explosion. The public is surprised. But prior to this surprise, it has been seen an absolutely, uh, it has been seen an absolutely nor an ordinary scene of no special consequence. Now let's take a suspense situation. The bomb is underneath the table and the public knows it probably because they have seen Hitchcock. <laughs> um, uh, uh, has a very long quote about the difference between the scene where a bomb suddenly goes off in a peaceful scene and, and one where we know the bomb is under the table ticking while the characters chat. Chat. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a good explanation. All right. Cool. Thank you, Green Lion Girl. Oh, Advent Children Rewatch. I think I saw a scene of that. Or probably, I, maybe I saw this, the whole thing. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, let's continue. Let us continue. All right. Not too much uh, ahead. So, um... Next, so we, we talked about execution and ambiguous writing. Let's see if I can say that word again. Execution and ambiguous writing. Next is the integrity of characters. Now, I'm not talking about integrity like honesty and decency. I'm actually talking about the core nature of characters. You do not contradict your characters in writing. That is an example of a misstep, a, a writing misstep or something that is flawed in writing. And I would say with the Siege of Mandalore, I would say Anakin was the biggest victim in this. If season seven is the same, is taking the same exact uh, uh, sequence of events, you know, it's it's in the same time. It's at, it's it's the exact same time as Revenge of the Sith. We should be seeing Dark Side Anakin by now. Now we did see a little bit with his execution of Admiral Trench in the Bad Batch arc, but going from that to this like excitable little puppy, you know, yipping at Ahsoka's feet, that's not Dark Side An Anakin. Not, not, not by a long shot. I am not. After seeing his exchange with Ahsoka, I am not ready to see Anakin 
don the, the black mantle and the black helmet and, and become Darth Vader. It's just, it just does not work. He's just too much like a lovable Anakin Skywalker at that point. I mean, when he, when he leaves Ahsoka, when, when she wishes him good luck and he, and he says good luck too, or whatever, I don't see any dark side Anakin. I, I, I don't, like he looks jilted a little bit when you know she raises her hand and says we have to talk another time. But other than that, he, I mean, he looks hurt, but he still looks like a good, decent fellow. There, there's no, no dark side propensity whatsoever in his exchange with Soka. And then all of a sudden, you know, yeah, we get the killing, and and he's different. Remember, Revenge of the Sith when when he's killing. Count Dooku, or right before, you do see that dark edge. You know, Hayden Christensen does play that dark edge just just a little bit, and we just do not see any dark edge in in that season. So I, I think that's a huge contradiction to his trajectory to the dark side, to his to his character arc. He's too much light side. He's not ready to choke his wife to death, or at least asphyxiate her you know, to, to pass out. He just doesn't look like that. He, he, for all the dark tendencies in, in Clone Wars, the movie or Attack of the Clones, the movie, and then also Revenge of the Sith. Come on, come on, Filoni. He should have had way more edge than, than, than he had in, in your arc, the Siege of Mandalore. People say, oh, no, it's supposed to be heartwarming. It's like, actually, you know, that's another reason why Ahsoka shouldn't have even met Anakin, because we really should be seeing a menacing kind of Anakin at this point. We should be afraid of him being in the room. You know, Obi-Wan should feel uns unsure, uncertain, like something's not right with his friend. The council should feel unsure. He, you know, he's wearing the black mantle, for goodness sake, in, in the Revenge of the Sith. He, his clothes are dark. You know, Obi-Wan's clothes are, they're still brown, but they're a lighter tone. And he's hes wearing kind of like that beige brown, um, you know, outfit. You know, his attire is a lighter color. Now, Anakin's attire has always been dark. It's been kind of like that dark purple in the Clone Wars animation. But its it's supposed to point to his dark tendency, his dark nature. Don't see it. Don't see it with his exchange with Ahsoka. So, um... I, I think that's just another reason why um, Ahsoka's meeting with Anakin was unnecessary. Because if anything, he should have had the dark propensities, and she should have been on guard. That that would probably that would probably be very interesting to see. You know, here's another good idea. Maybe she does go back to the Jedi Council, and then she's happy to see him. But then he he behaves in a way that really makes her on edge like this isn't my teacher anymore like i wanted to try this jedi thing out again and and he's changed for the worst that that would have been pretty powerful i tell you i should have been on the writing committee right come on feloni hire me don't hire me i i, I don't think we would be i think i think we would be butting heads quite a bit so the integrity of characters. Now, Anakin is the biggest victim of this, but you know, um, Kenobi also. He just he just looks careless. He 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 looks um, he looks thoughtless. Like he doesn't have a lot of discretion. He goes against the will of the council. So there's contradictions in his actions and his motives. Um, Darth Maul, who should be incredibly intelligent. I mean, he he took over Mandalore. He should have some level of intelligence. He acts pretty carelessly himself, and Palpatine acts short-sighted all because it's it's got to revolve around Ahsoka Tano. Now, speaking of Ahsoka Tano, here's a, here's another thing. Um, so first with, with the integrity of your characters, do not contradict your characters. If your if your characters are going on a trajectory, you cannot contradict it by, by, by way of time. You know, dark side Anakin is pretty much at this point here. He's not happy go lucky pup, puppy light side Anakin anymore. So there's that. Um, so the time of the trajectory, the motives all along the trajectory, the interaction and the exchange. So don't contradict your characters on their arc, on their journey, whether they're good guys or bad guys, because both good guys and bad guys suffer under, under this uh, kind of writing, as we see with 
Anakin, Obi-Wan, Maul, and Palpatine. <laughs> All right. Here's a really, really, really important thing. Don't make your characters sociopaths if you don't want them to be sociopaths. I'm not against writing a you know sociopathic character. Usually villains, guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, go go write a dastardly vile sociopath as, as a character. But as far as your protagonists are, are concerned, don't make them sociopaths. Um, the writing, and actually the prof, I, I was bringing up some examples of this uh, sociopathic uh, treatment with Ahsoka Tano, um, but actually prof really expanded it out to sociopathic writing in general. And what that is, is a sociopath only sees themselves and the reality is bending to them. And it doesn't matter um, if it's at the expense of other people, at the expense of truth, you know, at the expense, you know, kind of, you know, people who are sociopathic, they, they are sadistic. They don't care if people are in pain. They don't care if people are compromised. That's an example of a sociopath. With sociopathic writing, everything bends and orbits around this one character at the expense of other characters with flawed writing and, and contradictions, and also at the expense of the world and the reality inside that world. Now, now we, we see this with, with everything orbiting around this planet called Ahsoka Tano. <laughs> um, but there are two instances where she actually behaves in a rather sociopathic way. I didn't, I didn't pick this up until I saw this, this, uh, this arc a few times because I needed to review it with for, for all this commentary. But in the events of the Siege of Mandalore, there are two people mortally wounded. One is a civilian and he's a weasel. He's the prime minister in Mandalore at the time, uh, the prime minister Almec. And then another is a trooper. Both are shot in the chest and they are mortally wounded. Both are dying in front of her. Now, with the prime minister, it's really sadistic. He, I don't know, for whatever reason, he's dying and he feels the need to say a certain important piece of information. If I'm shot in the chest and I'm dying, I would just need a time of space and solitude before my departure. I, as a character, probably wouldn't have the need to say anything else to anyone else. Like, I got to reveal this really important information about this man named Skywalker who Maul is after. He's dying. He's, he's, he's shot in the chest and he feels compelled to say this information. I would feel compelled to just fold my arms and just, just, just lay down against the wall and, and go. But he has to have this information. Now, as weird as that is, it gets even weirder and even more peculiar and, and more disturbing when Ahsoka is shouting at him to get this information. He's like, he's, he mentioned a name, Maul. He's talking about Maul, this prime minister dying. And she has her arm on the shoulder like she's supposed to be comforting him or whatever. He's like, he, he was mentioning a name, a name he's after. And she says, what is the name? <laughs> That's how she says it too. She's in his face, this dying man's face and says, what is the name? First of all, if she didn't know it was the name Skywalker, is it really that important information? And then he says, Skywalker. And then he falls. He dies at her feet. He collapses forward in front of her. And rather than be shocked that a man has just died at her feet, she just contemplates Anakin. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. A man just died in front of you. And people could say, well, Michelle, Ahsoka's used to this warfare. She's used to people dying in front of you. Well, first of all, come on, have some respect for any death. Second of all, this is a civilian. Yeah, he's a total weasel as a character, but he's still a civilian. He's not, I mean, people say, well, no, he's a Mandalorian. He, he, he fought a little bit with Bo-Katan. I don't care. <laughs> he's, he's a political figure. War obviously was not in his nature. And so for a person of that status and that nature to just suddenly collapse in front of you dead, and then you, you can't even dwell on that. You're just dwelling on, oh, no, and again, why did he say Skywalker? It just, the guy died in front of you, lady. You know, it's just like, 
like what is his name like in that in in his face that that's just really crude um like she she wants information for her own benefit for her own knowledge at the expense of a dying man i'm sorry that's weird to me that's really strange to me next we have a, a clone trooper who is also mortally wounded he's shot i think in the chest or in the stomach so obviously he's he's going uh, there's no she doesn't shout for medic this time too um she she puts her her arm her hand on his arm he even she even says what his name is like oh this is your name right and then um and that after that her care for him just goes out the window you know he's saying he's coughing up you know and, and all this phlegm probably blood too he's like <laughs> maul maul he we were ambushed and and he he was talking about you he, he was asking for you and right when he says he's asking for you she just looks like she she blinks like oh he wants me um this is this is all about me i got to i got to solve this information i've got to solve this crime like wait 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 just just let the man have a peaceful passing comfort him be with him you know be with him and make it as peaceful as possible but don't make this about you why why is someone shot in the chest mortally wounded going down like about to die Feel the need to tell Ahsoka, this this guy, this enemy was asking about you. Like, actually, like, to me, it kind of was like, he was, he was asking about you. He thought you were cute. Wanted to ask you on a date. And then fall to his death. That, that's, what it, that's what it looks like. It's just like, it's like why, is it, why is this about Ahsoka Tano? And, and why does she need to know this information? And her reaction, like, no, no. Like, a noble thing for a protagonist to do is say, shh, shh, shh. Don't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You need to relax. You need to breathe. I'm here for you. Um, you know, who, who are your closest friends? I, I will send my condolences, like be there for their death. It's not about you. It's not about you, but that's an example of sociopathic writing where it's like people dying in front of her, feeling the need to give information all about her. That is that that revolves around Ahsoka Tano. You know, this this, this we're orb, all orbiting around this planet, Ahsoka Tano. Not caring. Apparently, these characters don't care about their their being mortally wounded and they're about to die. I mean, come on, think about put yourself in that position. I, I'd be thinking, okay, was I a good person? Did did I live my life to 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 serve people? Was was did did my life amount to good things? <laughs> that those would be the questions I'd be asking before um, departing. So don't make your character sociopaths unless you want a villain who is a sociopath. And uh, as far as the integrity ultimately of the character, I, I can't think of a finer example than as I've said before, as I've discussed before, Ahsoka's morally abhorrent decision to release Maul. So keep your protagonist noble, you know, or, or they just get contradicted all the time. And lastly, uh, one more thing. So we've got the uh, execution, ambiguous writing, integrity of characters, and now finally, overindulgent writing. Now, I did a whole video on this back in... Um, November, a little bit before Thanksgiving. Um, indulgent writing. You can love, love, love your characters. You can love your characters to death. You can think the world of them, but the world can't revolve around them. So examples of this is character inserts. So with, with Ahsoka, you know, she's inserted everywhere. Now, of course, I've said this already. Ahsoka could have her own arc. She really should have had her own series outside the Clone Wars after she left the Jedi Order. She could have had her own animated series on the Siege of Mandalore. But it would have to be away from the Jedi and away from the Clone Troopers and away from Anakin. That would have been a great... That, that, that could have been a, actually... That could have been a long TV series too. That could have been a longer TV series. Not a four-episode arc. And And... I think her natural journey, I would say her journey would be much more natural, much more organic uh, with her own separate story outside the Clone Wars. So have, have, have herself just, just have her not be in 
any way, shape, or form involved with the Clone Wars. So um, character inserts. So, uh, you know, uh, the reactions to events, as, as we talked about Anakin's killing with uh, Dooku, or, or his killing Dooku, that was only inserted by Obi-Wan to get a reaction from Ahsoka. We wanted to see her react. Don't write a scene, especially a confusing scene, just to get a character reaction. Like a short character reaction, like a like a, a facial gesture or, or or something that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, the scene can lead up to react a reaction, but it has to make sense before. All the things, all the character motives, as I've said before, every single decision any character makes for, for another character to have a reaction of something or an event has to make sense in the narrative. Just has to. Otherwise, if it doesn't make sense and you're just having this for us to see a character's reaction, that's that's a character insert. You know, um, really, Ahsoka's busy with Maul. She just doesn't even need to have that information about Anakin to begin with. Uh, also, the example of overindulgent writing with Ahsoka is for her to learn from Maul about Anakin's trajectory to the dark side. If, if Obi-Wan wasn't aware until the very end and Padme, Anakin's wife, wasn't aware of his turn to the dark side until the very end, you know, until she's actually being choked by him, Ahsoka for goodness sake, does not need to be aware of this possible turn to the, di the dark side. Unnecessary presence in certain events, as I said before, the whole Siege of Mandalore was, for, was really only for Ahsoka to be involved with Order 66 so we could see that she survived. She didn't need to be involved in the war at all. That's, that's all I have to say. And um, going back to, you know, Maul trying to say to Ahsoka, oh, Anakin's the new apprentice, uh, character's knowledge of things that couldn't otherwise possibly be known. Palpatine would have not revealed such information to Maul, an enemy. He's not an ally. He's an enemy. So Maul, just from the right off the bat, would not even have that kind of information, have that information that Anakin is turning to the dark side and becoming this new apprentice, this, this Darth Vader figure. So um, that, that, those are examples of overindulgence in writing where you, you've got character inserts, characters being in scenes that they don't need to be in, uh, characters' reactions that you really don't need to see as a viewer or a reader, and also um, knowledge. You know, if, if it doesn't make sense for that character to have that bit of knowledge, don't include it. That's an example of overindulgence in your writing. So... Those are the categories on how Dave Filoni, in this cautionary tale, how he has shown us uh, not, uh, what he has shown us not to do, how he has shown us uh, not to write. So again, execution, ambiguous writing, integrity of characters, and overindulgent writing. Execution or order of execution, things have to make sense for the scene to take place, ambiguous writing, being clear about characters' motives, characters' dialogue, and characters' reactions. Integrity of characters. Don't contradict your characters, your well-established characters like Anakin Skywalker and all the rest. Don't make your characters sociopaths and don't, don't uh, write in a sociopathic way involving those characters. And overindulgent writing, don't insert your characters where they don't need to be. And that's my, that's my conclusion. That is my conclusion of the Siege of Mandalore. Have I made my case? Dang it. <laughs> I think I've made a very strong case. I've, I've had two streaming videos, two, two commentary videos, and a final streaming video. So I'm done. I am done. I don't need to say anything more about the Siege of Mandalore. If it, you know, if it, if, if it, if it brings, if it comes up in, in topic, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I think I've said everything I've ever wanted to say about the writing of the Siege of Mandalore. Uh, Wolf10 says, speaking of Final Fantasy VII, in my story, I'm writing my character's twin sibling like Sephiroth. 
without the parental issues. You mean a good twin and a bad twin? Good and bad twins are overrated. You should have um, good twins all around or bad twins all around. I don't know what Sephiroth is as far as a villain. Uh, he's 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 a sociopath for sure. Um, and he doesn't he have memory loss issues or something? I can't remember. But but I think Cloud has too. Can't remember either. I don't know what you mean by that, Samuel. But I'm sure a lot of people get the reference. Um, I'm. Uh, I imagine that season seven, Anakin would turn into every satire version of Vader. He would be robot chicken Vader. Dr. Y says, instead of her shunning him, he'd be shunning her, giving her the cold shoulder. Oh man, that would have been, that would have been heartbreaking. That would have been a heartbreaking thing to see. You know, at this point with, with the events of the uh, Revenge of the Sith, this meeting between Ahsoka Tano and Anakin should not be heartwarming. It should be heartbreaking. Uh, Anakin has a lot on his mind at the time, and that makes way more sense. I've, absolutely. Like, he's hiding, you know, um, oh, well, this is before he knows of Padme being pregnant. Um, but he's got a lot on his mind. You know, he's got a lot on his mind. Yeah. Wolf 10 says, yes, I will not say probably amen because I usually keep that for spiritual purposes. Uh, but yes, that's what it is. I can't stand it when writers are telling us how much of a good guy a character is, but when we are actually, but when we actually view the hero, what they are doing is sociopathic. Yeah. It's really important to catch. And by the way, this is easy to do. I'm not faulting Filoni for doing this. He loves Sokotano. It's actually a natural I would say a natural, um, this, this propensity to make your characters look good. We, we want to make the characters we love look good, be they heroes or villains. We want to make them shine in their own way, in their own light. But we have to remember, what, what would you do in a situation like that? What would you do in front of a dying man? Would you shout for information? I mean, I know... Okay, I'm not saying this hasn't happened in TV before. I'm sure it's happened in detective shows and crime thrillers and all of that. But try to see it from a real life situation. No, no, it's like Agent Coulson, man. He he is ready to be there for the the person about to go down, and he he makes it as peaceful and as calming as possible. That is a good man. That's a good character. When, when the person should be terrified of their impending doom and he's there just hold, almost holding their hands if it's safe because some of these characters have been contracted, contracting alien viruses, but you know what I mean. Uh, actually, you know, to be honest, Coulson or a character like Coulson really helps me write a good protagonist. No spoilers, guys. No spoilers. So we actually uh, finished the episode leading into the events of The Winter Soldier. So no spoilers on Winter Soldier either. I haven't seen that movie. So we are watching that next Sunday. <laughs> it's Mother's Day too. Cool. <clears throat> Samuel Proctor says, The reveal of vital information for their last dying breath is more of a common trope. One that can either make sense or make no sense. In this case, it makes no sense. Yeah, okay, so um, I remember seeing this on Blacklist to the show. I think it was the Blacklist. Yeah, and, and it got too dark for me, so I, I ended up not watching it. But um, there's this one good character that's shot in the chest, and she, re she reveals a name to her shooter that only the name if that shooter reveals that name to another person, that person would understand that she was the shooter. She caused the, the, the woman's death, the, this good guy's death. I, I was so put off by that. It was like, why would you reveal a name and think that your killer is going to reveal that same name to someone in, um, you know, FBI? <laughs> just uh, motives, guys, actions. It just doesn't make sense. Now, 
maybe like someone's dying breath. Um, I can imagine maybe an elder, you know, having a good long life and revealing very important secret information to uh, to maintain his or her lineage. That's fine. That makes sense. Um, but it has to make sense, guys. It has to make sense. It's like a, it's, uh, oh, um, what's that version, Prof, of the Christmas Carol? Uh, you you watch when when um, Marley, in his, his last word, says, we were wrong. <laughs> we were wrong. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, that kind of that 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 kind of works. Like we were wrong. We we did not live our lives the way we should have. That that's like there, it was that last plea for for Ebenezer Scrooge to say, "Listen, I'm dying, but you still have a chance." That's that's heroic. You know that that's a good motive for a dying character to to do. So yeah, there there are, it, it can work, but it, it has to make sense. <laughs> Wolf Ten says, "If written well, it can be broken, and the heroes can can have pieced it together. Could have pieced it together. That's the other thing too. Is like, come on, guys, have these protagonists be some somewhat like a, a detective, like piece things together, find these clues. Oh, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 mine. So good, probably." Lord Captain, I feel like you're from Orville Nation. Lord Captain Commander Dunn decided to film a smoky scene inside a house with thick smoke and needing to hospitalize several people, I mean. Is that a Hitchcock technique? <laughs> Hi, Professor Geek. Always a pleasure. Um, oh, I'm, I'm, I've caught up with chat. Oh, or maybe chat jumped. Oh, chat jumped, guys. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm reading comments out of context. Uh, one second. And if I'm caught up with chat, I actually might, um, you know, wrap it up because I I would like to continue on with my music if, if I can. Uh, Lord Captain, Commander Dunn, welcome. Never, ever fall into the trap of these performances, uh, these, these faces as the end goal of the scene or storyline. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's um yeah, with, with reactions that don't make sense when motives are are all wrong. Yeah. It cannot it cannot come at the expense of the story. Dr. Y says, if there's one good thing to come from Disney Star Wars, it shows us what not to do creatively creatively, and that is correct. My and my hair's sticking to my face. <laughs> oh thank you man it's really interesting all of these critiques could be applied to later seasons of game of thrones well done sound engraver well i know nothing about game of thrones so i certainly can't be the first to be objective about game of thrones but i do understand that um the writing had gone quite south wasn't it when the book started stopping. <laughs> uh, but I understand that it was a mess by the, by the last season. It's a little, it's a little, it's not my cup of tea as, as a, as a Christian. Um, I, I just can't see that gratuitous violence and, and nudity, but it, I, I'm not going to say it's not a good story if it's, if it is a good story, but yeah, the writing has to be. Now here's the thing. I, I'm a musician. Okay. I'm, Okay, let me finish my sentence. The writing has to be good. <laughs> I'm a musician. I'm a composer. I, my 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 main forte when it comes to art is music and the way of composing music and the way of um, performing music. Now, music has narrative. Music has analysis. Music has structure. Music has all the things that writing has. But I will talk about writing on my channel because I write space opera. I write science fiction. I've, I've been writing science fiction since 2012. And I've been writing frequently since 2012. And so writing is very, very important to me. And so when I see things that are celebrated and praised for their quality, when in truth, they're not so good in quality, I've got to bring that up. That's kind of the academic in me too. It's like, 
Well, I mean, I was, I was, I was taught to analyze in kind of a postmodernistic way uh, in, in school, but now I'm writing from a place of hope and hopefully virtue, <laughs> uh, you know, a place of optimism as an independent creator, but also pretty strict and pretty objective. I mean, I'm a music teacher. That's right. That's my profession. So I have to be strict in order to get good results. I have a method. I have a technique. I have a way of communicating. I have a way of ushering very important things to the students like practicing and discipline. So I am kind of no nonsense when it comes to creativity like that. Um, you can be very expressive and very imaginative, but there has to be that objective line. Something that is poorly done should not be applauded as wonderfully done. And the Siege of Mandalore is this, this prime case, um, this, this primary case, I should say, uh, where people just called it perfect. I'm like, oh, far from, and let me tell you why. And of course, he's waving his sound engraver pom poms. They are electric blue, which, by the way, Wolf Ten, do you think electric blue works on a tire like dress? I can understand electric blue working if it's against like a dark gray or a black or a dark blue, but by itself, would it work on on a piece of clothing? I don't know. Just throwing that out there. Uh, well, 10 says, not a bad twin, just an antagonist. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess, like, I'm a twin who's really close friends with my with my sister. So um, we have our differences, sure. Um, she loves the Siege of Mandalore, for instance. <laughs> um, but uh, we have our differences, but we are very, very close. And, and we don't act like rivals or, or antagonists. Oh, palm palms, yeah. Pom poms. Yes, Wolf 10. That is correct. That too, Wolf 10. <laughs> Every time I think of the word pom pom, I think of Pomeranian. And they, they kind of look like pom poms. And they're they're the size of pom poms too. I say palm. I, I, I do say the L, actually, now that I think about it. Pom pom. There. I said it right. Um... Interesting. Okay. Uh, RT is not, this isn't directed to me and welcome RT. Nice to see you. Uh, you. You mentioned that, you know, as, as you say, it's, it's a pile of not so good stuff. Thank you for saying horse manure instead of other stuff. Um, but it's the marketing that was stronger. The marketing for that season was huge. Do you guys remember this was before the pandemic? Uh, it was the, um, I think it took place in Chicago. Was it 2019? And it took place in Chicago. That was an epic event. I mean, the, the, the panel of cast members were there. Dave Filoni was there. Um, all, you know, all, so all the voice actors were there. Uh, they had a really good trailer. It was a really good trailer. And, you know, the thing is, when I first heard that trailer, when I first saw that trailer, um, you hear Darth Maul's voice saying, I was hoping for Kenobi. Why are you here? And then we see him fight Ahsoka. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool because I like Ahsoka, but there better be a darn good reason why she's there and not Kenobi. And again, her fighting Maul would have been fine, but Kenobi should not have been involved. And I said that on my last stream. There was a hundred year old treaty, guys. Jedi interference with the Mandalorians would have been a big no-no and Maul should have... Um, um, factored that in. And so there's no reason for him to expect, expect Kenobi to begin with. But anyway, all that can be seen on my other streams on the replay, on my other videos. In fact, actually, I'll probably have a, a Star Wars playlist because I do have now enough for a playlist library. And it's all Disney Star Wars. No, no, that's not true. I, well, it is a little true. And I'm talking about the music also. Yeah, I'm talking about, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I have a lot of Star Wars commentary now that I think about it. I should have a Star Wars playlist. I'll, I'll, I'll organize that. And then you guys can catch all that. This all, all the replay. I 
Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to win the, the code or swoop races so I don't embarrass myself on stream. My brain is too divided, uh, avoiding uh, homonyms. homonyms. Uh, actually, probably I probably will wrap this up around 1130 because I really would like to do some composing and just get this album out. Um, I, I'd like to release this by the end of the month. I have four tracks. They should be simple once they're done. Um, and then, uh, I, actually, if you want to confirm, Prof, do, do you have in mind to do a game stream tonight uh, of Coder, uh, Knights of the Old Republic? Uh, and I'll tune in for that. I'll just be composing in the background. Um, so, yeah, we'll wrap it up here. But let me let me take a look on uh, comments. Comments. Uh, it's almost the two hour mark. See, the, 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 these Star Wars streams, man, they, they go by so fast for me. I'm like, wow. Yes, yes. Uh, um, oh, oh, man, where, where is it? Alistar Sim as Scrooge. So that, yeah, that's that's a that that's a that's a that's a that that that's a that's a very tense, beautifully done tense um, rendition of the Christmas Carol. Where, like, I like. I mean, if I think about it, like if, if, if all my lights are off at home because I'm, you know, by myself and I hear that reverberated Scrooge, I get I freak myself out like that. That's really scary to me. And I can't even imagine Scrooge in that situation. Um, and he's wailing. It's like, oh, I was wrong. And I'm trying to show you that you still have a way. <laughs> I mean, it's just like kind of like rips your heart out. It's. It's kind of melodramatic acting, but it's also like it's it's good. It's also really good. Really enjoyed your video. Oh, about heroes a few days ago. That must have been the, for the prof because I talk about heroes, but not on the level of that pr the professor does. Oh, it's a thing that happened during the final season of Game of Thrones. Ah, uh, that I remember that being talked at, about for like a year. It was pretty much on the same scale as uh, the sequel trilogy. Okay, Alec, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Great stream. I appreciate that. I have some other ideas for some good streams ahead. More, more general art, art business, and all that good stuff. I'd like to talk about Hans Zimmer too as a composer one of these days. Anyway, uh, and now, and now, uh, our, um, Dr. Wise suggested other editions or renditions, interpretations of the Christmas Carol. RT says George R. R. Martin needs to finish two more books in order to finish the saga. Last book was published 2011. That's 10 years ago. He's old and not healthy. Um, I see him pass, let's say that a little bit lighter, uh, while writing the seventh book. I, I, you know, I remember dwelling on it for like, I remember commuting to work, just kind of thinking about this. And, you know, I have never been in a position of power or extreme wealth, so I cannot make that call on how I would make that decision. But if you got a world, I mean, a world of fans waiting for subsequent books in a series. I'm not even talking about books in general, but subsequent installments of a series. And you just sit on that for years? I'm sorry. People call him the American Tolkien and he doesn't earn that. He does not earn that. Now I'm not, don't, guys, don't, don't harp on him. He's a person too. And we got to treat everybody decently. Uh, but as far as professional, if you, when, 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 can you imagine having an audience of millions of people just waiting for your work to be published? I don't think I, I would be pulling all nighters all the time. Probably not because that's not healthy, but um, I can't even imagine that level of affluence and influence. Um, that's crazy. That's it. But, but more than that, it's not the money. It's not the fame it strikes me as an incredible disservice to, to people who would want your work. Now, if I, I can understand if you have a, a traumatic thing happen in your life or you have health issues that stop you from, from doing that. Let, let's say, let's say my hand gets cut off or something or in a car accident, like I have, you know, my hands impaled or whatever, and, and it has to go, or I have like a prosthetic hand well, that stops me from playing violin. So I can't do violin anymore. And I think that for a long time, that would, that would put me out of composing just because 
the idea of not playing violin would actually really depress me. I'd have to fight. I, I, I know just the way I play violin and I love violin, I would have to overcome an incredible amount of, ang not anxiety, but um, probably depression, some very serious, uh, I don't want to say chronic depression because I, I have faith in Jesus and, and he's everything to me and he would fill that hole. But oh my gosh, that would put me out of work even just composing where, where I wouldn't need my left hand. Um, so, yeah, I can understand if something happens tragically in your life or you are out of work, you know, pretty much out of commission physically or mentally or anything else or emotionally. But 10 years, 10 years when I don't know if he had a tragedy in his life. I, I don't know. In fact, if I had a tragedy. Oh, who was the who was the famous person? Oh, wasn't it Liam Neeson? You know, he lost his wife to a, um, a ski accident. Oh, what's her name? She was in Parent Trap. Really pretty British lady. She's she's pretty famous too. Um, but she she was she passed away because of a ski accident on a ski trip. And I heard whether an article or an interview, I heard that he continued acting to move through that pain of losing his wife. That's pretty admirable. Admirable. It, obviously you for a reason to keep moving. You know, he loved the work and honored the work. He wasn't in it for the money. He he needed that kind of work so he wouldn't be beside him, himself in, in, in grief. And I think that that that's pretty healthy. <clears throat> I don't know why the, his wife's name is escaping me. She's she's pretty well known. twins in shows or movies are usually the odd or creepy characters. Yeah, they can be the eccentric characters for sure. Samuel Proctor says, when Siege of Mandalore came out, I was still a fan of Disney Star Wars and was one of the people who called it perfect at the time. Hey man, I I, I, I said this before. I admit, I saw The Last Jedi and I loved it. You know why? Because the sound design was awesome. I loved it for the sound design. I didn't even think about Luke Skywalker. All I was thinking about was the sound design. So yeah, I, I fell into that trap too. <laughs> Dr. Y says, electric blue work does work with clothing. I think I use a similar color in one of my recent renders to emulate glowing effects. Yeah, your green, the, your use of greens and blues is really awesome. It's really, really awesome. <laughs> well, Ted... There are two animals I don't trust in this world. Tarantulas are still the top. Dolphins and Pomeranians. Why? Did you watch um, who, uh, Taj Maori? I, I grew up with the Maori, uh, Maori twins or Maori twins. I, I can't I can't pronounce their names. Um, but um, Tia and Tamara. Um, I grew up with them because they were twins, and I was I'm a twin too, and I, I really love that show. But I actually grew up with smart guy. I actually grew up with um, Taj Maori first. And there's this really weird Disney film with him and his older brother, well, an actor who's, who plays his older military brother. And they just get, they just get terrified. They get terrorized by this possessed Pomeranian. I forgot his, I think her name is Camille. So she's this kind of sweet white palm Pomeranian. And then without her med medication, they, they do a very scary looking puppet. It's like, it traumatized me as, uh, as a teenager watching that. Uh, but I can, I can only guess that that's because you would, you would say that of Pomeranians. All right. Okay. So professor is saying, I think I'll do the game stream tomorrow night, but would that be after the rewatch? Because the rewatch is tomorrow night, right? Oh, okay. You have to ca cancel the Narnia rewatch tomorrow. Okay. Alrighty. Um, uh, the the Lord Captain Commander Dunn. Good name. Ooh, I like what you have to say about narrative structure. Yes, it's important in music, musical narrative, and it's important in writing. There are a lot of parallels between music and writing. You know, the, the pace of prose, the pace of dialogue, musical events. You know, it's, um, uh, l let me give you an example. Uh, beautiful prose can actually be quite uh, uh, pedantic, pen pedantic, 
if I'm saying that word correctly, uh, or too redundant or too, uh, too much. It can be just too syrupy. Even if it's beautiful prose and done well at, at a certain length, it can get actually quite tiresome unless you're, you know, an older reader, like of the 1800s, you know, in Abraham Lincoln's day, you know, um, that that's fine because no one had television or radio back then, so they went to the books. So that was their entertainment, of course. Uh, but a lot of beautiful prose, even with a good flow, with with certain length, can actually be tiresome over time. It's the same way with music. You could have very attractive sounds. You could have very attractive harmonies and a harmonic progression. But at a certain length, if it's done too much, even the beauty that is in that music can be tiresome. So there are there are parallels. That's just one example. Uh, well, Tim says, for for more details of my twins, a strange rivalry in fighting in principles uh, and aims for why they are fighting in a tournament. One tends to be more bu brutal in a fight. Wow. I don't think, I mean, maybe it's because I'm a woman, but I don't think I could ever combat my sister. That would be, that would be heart-wrenching. Unless it was like a, like a competitive team like basketball or something. Thank you, Melissa. I'm not going just yet, but I got to I got to sneeze, guys. All right. <laughs> well, Ted says, yeah, he's not American Tolkien for sure, and he's still human as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. Y says, I've, I've been, I've been, I've seen this. I've been seeing he's been called this. What? George R. R. Martin is called the American Tolkien? Martin is even the same ballpark as Tolkien. Tolkien was a scholar. Not only was he a scholar, but he was Christian. He was, he had a very clean, high art kind of fantasy. I think Game of Thrones had probably the potential of being high art, but it's certain, it, it's very gratuitous. It, it's, it's for the modern setting. And I hate saying that, but that decadence, Tolkien didn't write decadence. This is why Amazon is not going to work for that world. Because if they go on the decadence route, man, and fornication and stuff like that, that's not Tolkien. Okay. That's not Middle Earth. There, there, there's, there's, um, there's evil in his stories, but it's done in a very clean way way. I mean, if you could imagine that, like Helm's Deep is brutal, for instance, but it's done in a clean and noble way. It's not, it's not violence for the sake of, oh, here's some more gore. No, it's a race of men. And it's a, it's a small band of men protecting the last remnants of the Rohirrim by this overpowering race. There's going to be violence. It's going to be okay to incorporate that violence, but appropriate violence. Um, current uh, American Tolkien is Brandon Sanderson. I'm not, I'm not, I, I've never read any of his books, but I understand he's pretty prestigious. I see him on YouTube sometimes in, in my feed on how to write. Oh, okay. Natasha Richard, Richardson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, I was pretty shocked when I found that out. Yeah. Natasha Richardson, she, beautiful lady. Just so classy. So beautiful. Um, and she, I think she was in her 40s um, when it when it happened. It's really, really, really sad. All right. Uh, let me go ahead. Let me just catch up with chat and then wrap things up. I once thought of what would happen if I uh, lose my drawing dominant hand. I remembered Frazetta taught himself to do art with his left hand. Yeah, actually, um, who was it? I think it was Ravel. Uh, there's a famous left-hand concerto by Maurice Ravel. Uh, left-hand piano concerto. And um, it, it, you only utilize your left hand. And it's hard. <laughs> yes, Dr. Y, I am a twin. My, my twin is expecting her first child in a few months. It will be my first time being an aunt. And it's a niece. So I will be an aunt of a niece. I, it'd be cool to have a nephew. I, I would love to have a nephew. Um, Prof has nieces. He doesn't have any nephews. So I, I kind of, I hope, you know, down the line, if, if my sister has a more, more kids, hopefully I, I teach us, I teach a girl who was one of six girls. Like they never had <laughs> that the poor father. I mean, he, obviously I see so much love in that family. So he loves all his six girls, but just girls, 
Just girls. This is getting out of hand. Now there are, there are two of them. That's funny. Uh, Craig, um, is it Wagner? Is that how you pronounce? Um, I'm of the opinion that anyone who wants to rush Martin needs to think hard about how easily a story like um, A Song of Ice and Fire can go downhill when rushed. I mean, look at this show. Patience will be reward, reward in my opinion. I, I, I'm fine with patience. My space opera, like, so I just finished, I just finished the first part of my book. It's actually going to be divided into two books because it is pretty long. That, that took three years to finish the first draft. And I, and I, and I write frequently. Uh, and I've been writing, you know, since 2012. So I understand long feats, but now I don't know the history of his, his books, like how fast they were written, how fast they were accepted and stuff like that. Um, but when it's so long... If it takes this number of years after crafting it and reworking it and revising it, sure, I understand. But it's my impression, like just by fans of his, that he's been sitting on it. Like he hasn't been really working on it. So I don't know. I don't know the situation. So I could be giving him a fair, an unfair assessment. But but major fans of the of the the books. I've seen on YouTube complain that he's not been doing anything about it. Neo little Napoleon complexes, I call them. Yes, fight too much with reckless abandon. Interesting. I'm not a little dog person. I'm I'm a I'm a big dog person. I, I know they're more work, obviously, with bathing and exercising and stuff like that, but um uh, I would, if I, if I were to have a dog, it'd be a senior dog and it would be a bigger dog. I, uh, I'm teaching, a, a, I teach a woman and her daughter, she's in her forties. She just got two new German shepherd puppies, but that's two of four now. <laughs> like German, four German shepherds. That's, I love German shepherds. They're one of my favorite dogs, but four German shepherds. That's a lot. <clears throat> uh, Lord Captain says Sa Sanderson is really good. He teaches creative writing at Brigham Young University. I is that is that in Idaho? Because I had I had a few friends that went there. All right. Um, all right. Couple more, and then let's just wrap it up because we're past the two hour mark. Uh, you're, you're talking about family. I had an idea about creating a royal family based on some of my cousins and their children. That's cool. That'd be fun. That would definitely be fun. <laughs> I like it, it is pronounced Wagner, but I, I kind of wish it was like the composer Wagner. I mean, I can call you Craig Wagner if you want. That's a lot of Craigs. We've got a Daniel Craig, then we've got a Daniel Heron, and then, um, Dr. Y, you're also Daniel. <laughs> it's just a lot of shared names. All righty. So uh, let's kind of go ahead and wrap it up. I really would like to get on to my music before it's too late and, and I lose um, mental interest. <laughs> um, so uh, Thursday, sound experimentation. So here, here's the deal. Um, I really want to get back into Super Collider, and I'm working on Super Collider on my own time. Um, but I think I'm going to put Super Collider on hold just a little bit, more granular synthesis to come. But I really, really, really want to get this album out by the end of the month. So I'm really working on my album this month. So it's going to be a lot of updates on my works in progress. Uh, so you can hear what's going on with my album. So that's probably going to be the nature of my Thursday videos, at least for a couple couple weeks. Uh, my, my Wednesday schedule has filled up a little more now, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching more, but I'm also commuting more. And this commute, I, it's a new studio. It is, it's a nice place, but it's a long commute, unfortunately. So um, I even had to lose a composition student because, because of my new schedule. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, but uh, in any case, um, 
So it's going to be sound experimentation in more Logic Pro, Super Clatter to come probably more into the summer. That's that's what it's looking like. Uh, I will try to continue that wonderful sound track series. Uh, I just haven't had the time to do extra videos in in, in these weeks, but I'm, I haven't abandoned the, the soundtracks. I know I didn't do it at all in April. I've just been pretty busy with my other projects. So uh, just be on the lookout for all these videos uh, on Thursdays for sound experimentation, of course, live commentary on Monday nights. If I do uh, a Saturday, Saturday commentary video, it will be fixed. It will be uploaded. It will be something you've seen on the stream. Um, but uh, that will that will also be a nice surprise, I guess, because <laughs> uh, I might just not have anything Saturday for, for a while. Hopefully I'll get more content out there as, as the summer and, and fall get in, and, and I get into the swing of things. But May is a pretty darn busy um, uh, month. And also um, I hope, depending on how it's marketed, I hope to actually start teaching at least one Logic Pro class this summer. Um, in, at one of my studios. And if I do end up having a lot of students for that class, or I, I actually could compose, I can teach up to three classes on that Logic Pro. Um, that will take up pretty much all my time. And I, in fact, if that does happen, and this will start in June, if it does, I would actually have to um, take a break from Monday night streaming and uh, go into maybe a Saturday late afternoon stream um, before the rewatches. Uh, so I will make time to stream every week, but I've, I've given this class my my Monday nights, unfortunately, because Mondays and Fridays are the only time I can teach this class. But I really want to, I would like to be able to be successful at a class like this, teaching Logic Pro, beginning Logic Pro. So we'll see. I'll, I'll give you updates as, as I hear more. Uh, might not happen at all. I might continue streaming Monday nights anyway. But actually, if I do get this class and I do teach Monday nights, it would be for eight weeks. It wouldn't be permanent. So that's that. Anyway, uh, yes, RT says, may the fourth be with you. Yes, uh, unfortunately, that's a Disney thing. I, I thought that was just a general Star Wars thing, but oh well. Um, anyway, guys, you know the drill. Please, um, for any schedules, for any other upcoming streams, please refer to the Professor Geek Facebook group page. It's alive and well with some humor and some updates and some geek news. And um, always... Just uh, tune in to all, all our friends here for their rewatches, for their live commentary streams, for their gaming streams, and all of that good stuff. So I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks always for watching and listening. Always be on the lookout for some more sound experimentation every Thursday. And until I see you next, keep preserving and keep producing the art you love. And I will catch you later.